two degree range. Look at the coral reefs. Even with all the uncertainty in yellow and, and red, we estimate today that coral reefs on Earth are at risk already under two degrees Celsius. The Greenland ice sheet actually dips into Paris. Despite the large uncertainty range, we cannot exclude irreversibly triggering a loss of the Greenland ice sheet between two degrees and 4.5, committing humanity to a six to seven meter sea level rise. This is a message of precaution. Already at limited global warming, we are at risk of irreversible changes, which all have to do with stewardship of ecosystems and the biosphere. This leads to an equation, which I will argue is the scientific most important summary message to humanity, that the Anthropocene plus the evidence that the Holocene is our desired state of the planet, plus the recognition that we cannot exclude tipping points leads to the conclusion that we now need for our own sake to define planetary boundaries. The safe operating space for humanity within scientific targets for the systems that regulate the Earth system. Now these nine boundaries, which have now been scrutinized by science over the past 10 years, is not only climate, it's also biodiversity, oceans, land, nitrogen, phosphorus, and fresh water, all the systems that we are preoccupied within the global environment facility. We now need an integrated systems approach for climate and ecosystems to transform within this green space of security for humanity. We are unfortunately transgressing four of the nine boundaries. We are at risk and need transformative change for the future. It requires a deep mind shift, recognizing in everything we do, from finance to security to equity, that we're no longer the small world on the big planet. We can no longer deliver economic growth at the expense of biodiversity, overfishing, and the atmosphere. We are now the big world on the small planet. We've reached a saturation point. We're hitting the ceiling of hardwired biophysical processes regulating the state of the entire Earth system. Now this means that we need to change. Are we changing? Well, dear friends, we're not making the progress we need. This is a scientific publication that came out just a few months ago, the first time asking the question, what will it require to have good lives within planetary boundaries? What you see here are the countries in the world. On the x-axis, the number of transgressed planetary boundaries. On the y-axis, you see our indicators of social well-being, from life expectancy, human development index, longevity, equity, everything that we measure as success for social and economic well-being. The higher up we are on the y-axis, the better we perform socially and economically. Unfortunately, look where the rich countries are. We can only today deliver well on social indicators by transgressing planetary boundaries. This is unfortunately still the reality. Unsustainability is still the pathway to social well-being. We want to be in this corner where there's no country. We now need to define sustainable development as social inclusion and human prosperity within planetary boundaries. If you look carefully, dear friends, at this graph, there's one country that is really close to be in this safe, desired space, and it is Vietnam. So it's with pride to give this science speech right here at the heart of the country that is really starting to embed a people-planet agenda for social inclusion and social prosperity in the world. I'd like to close with some of the transformative implications of this science diagnostics. We now are working, and this is just a peak view on what will be presented at the high-level political forum in the UN in July as a report back on the sustainable development goals, that we now can identify six necessary transformations that are potentially sufficient to reach the sustainable development goals together with the Sustainable Development Solutions Network and partners around the world. 
If you look carefully here, it's not only about decarbonizing the energy system. It's not only about really getting the fourth industrial revolution to work for humanity. It's also about the biosphere, about food systems, about water, about transforming the way we manage the living biosphere. Let me pick out one of these, decarbonizing the climate system. We have recognized that reaching back into a safe space on climate will require nothing less than adopting a carbon law. This carbon law is about bending the curve of emissions, as reminded by Christiana Figueres at the Mission 2020, and decarbonizing the world economy by 2050, shown here by this gray curve, the carbon dioxide trajectories to us to stay under two degrees Celsius by 2050. But that, dear friends, is not enough. We need to go from a food system that is the single largest emitter of greenhouse gases and eroder of ecosystems shown in brown from being a prime source to becoming a net grand sink of carbon, a global agricultural revolution. But not even that is enough. We need to recognize, whether we like it or not, that we need negative emission technologies of grand scale, which requires integration with ecosystem management, for example, through BECS. But not even that is enough. We need to become stewards of the resilience of the biosphere, maintaining in green negative carbon sinks in ecosystems on land, and in blue on carbon sinks in oceans. Everything that we nurture, sustainable ecosystem management. And if we do all this, we have a 66% chance of reaching Paris. So this is, dear friends, nothing less than a reminder that we face a grand social transformation and a sustainable transformation, integrating ecosystems and climate. We can do this, and we're on the path, and it's like a Gordon Moore innovation pathway, not doubling the pace of computer speed in the world every 24th month, but actually halving emissions every decade takes us to Paris by integrating it with ecosystems. This is nothing less the exponential journey we're facing. It requires planetary stewardship. It requires from us recognizing that how we have defined sustainable development is really important. The human development, the ecological development, and the ecological and economic pillar of sustainable development. But we must recognize it has actually not delivered. We must recognize this has become what I call a Mickey Mouse economy. The economy has grown, thank you very much, at the expense of human capital and natural capital. We must now transition into a new logic. And we have the plan for this. We have the roadmap. We have the sustainable development goals. These 70 goals is the first way for us to really integrate social aspirations within planetary boundaries. But dear friends, we all recognize the world tends to adopt these as what I would call a Swedish smorgasbord, picking the favorite goals and moving on them. Scientifically, we need to reshape these goals into what I call the wedding cake. We have four non-negotiables. Goal six, 13, 14, 15. On water, biodiversity, climate, and our focus on oceans. Within that, we can have great explorations and success and innovation and prosperity on social and economic development. But it has to occur within scientific targets for the Earth system. This is the transformation we need. This is the transformation we want. So dear friends, to conclude, we now are the drivers of change and therefore the determinants of our own future within this thin layer. We face unprecedented global risks, but also unprecedented opportunities. We see that we've crossed a tipping point. We have evidence of having a global sustainability tipping point right as we speak on innovation, on equity, and on all the proof that sustainability now is the entry point for success, for health, for benefits, and equity for humanity. Transformations is what we need for human prosperity and social inclusion within planetary boundaries. It's necessary, as now Kweishi pointed out, but also possible and 
beneficial and to really get the bottom line ecosystems and biosphere are the fundamental paths to be integrated with everything we do from finance to economics to climate for us to succeed therefore denying i would argue is a turning point and critical tipping point for humanity in the future you have scientific support thank you so much and good luck Thank you so much, Johan. Well, Jeff is deeply committed to exploring, exploring the, the human um, welfare and sustainability within the planetary boundaries. And I personally learned so much from you, um, uh, Johan, and it was really the pleasure to working with you for the last few um, years. Now, Jeff also is lucky enough to have an advisory, a scientist advisory body, we called it STAP. And now the next guest is the head of the STAP, the Dr. Rosina Babin, Bian Bam. That and uh, she always actually that tell us how we would like to should use, uh, Jeff should use the science to um, when we think about the strategy and project and program. So, Rosina, the floor is yours very much. Uh, it is a daunting task to reflect on the eloquent and sobering remarks that you made, Johan. Um, the message of science is really that the pace of change is accelerating and that we really need massive transformation. And that's new knowledge. But this new knowledge is actually linked to some very old wisdom. And if you think back to some messages we got 2,500 years ago from the Chinese philosopher Lao Cha, he said, if you do not change direction, you will end up where you are headed. And where we are headed is to tipping points. You know, those planetary boundaries have defined all that has made human civilization possible over the many millennia. And those are the boundaries within which civilization can continue. It's very clear that we could be the first generation of humans in all that time to leave a legacy of irreversible problems which cannot be our legacy. So this session is about the voice of science. Science is key in helping us understand the problem, but also in imagining the possibilities and then to realize them, not just to monitor the trends and to set scholarly targets, but in designing real pathways of achieving systems transformation. So what can be done by us, the collection of countries and agencies and civil society in this room today that make up the Jeff Partnership to achieve those six global transitions that Johan called for. So STAP, our science group, believes that we must harness acceleration in three ways, in integration, in innovation, and in learning. And we believe in each of these areas, we can achieve tipping points of action to get to that sustainability. So first, in the area of integration, Achieving sustainability is not just about protecting forests or seascapes or producing energy and, and certainly no longer thinking about those issues one at a time because there are interactions, there are synergies, but there are also discordances. And Jeff is making integration a central theme of the next four years. Integration means tackling things in a systems approach. You know, our old way of take, make, waste, that is take resources, make something and throw it away, is simply not sustainable. And Naoko mentioned our food system. Well, the global food system is responsible for 70% of the freshwater withdrawals, for some 25% of greenhouse gas emissions, another 10 to 15% of land use change, and perhaps as much as 75% of biodiversity loss. But if we take a systems approach, a circular economy approach, and recycle the water, recycle the nutrients, reuse, use renewable energy, we can transform the system. And we can dramatically ease the pressure on several of those planetary boundaries. Uh, back in 2011, STAP warned about the emerging issue of plastics. And it is certainly an issue that has arrived. 
and matured. Plastics are in our fish, they're in our soil, they're in our drinking water. And we need a circular economy approach in plastics as well. We need to use alternate non-fossil fuel feedstocks. We need to increase the longevity. We need to reduce demand. We need to recycle and reuse. And we see countries and cities banning now single-use plastics, such as straws and plastic bags. And they are a public and now very visible start on the very important changing of behavior that we need. And so I think we are reaching a public tipping point of public opinion in this case on plastics. And there are solutions and there are new models. So systems thinking means tackling those three co-equal circles, the three parts of the problem Johan showed. Environment for sure, but also economic and also human well-being. There is scientific evidence that not integrating ecological, social, and economic issues can lead to the failure of projects. So integration means also addressing the roots of rural vulnerability, of inequality, of migration, and those are really the environmental dimensions of human security. But that also argues then that sustainability can't be the sole focus of the environment ministries, but it has to be integrated with finance, with planning, with energy, with industry and education nor can it be the domain of public sector alone. We need the vast resources and the ingenuity of the private sector. So the second acceleration is innovation. Innovation in technology, innovation in finance, and innovation in government and institutions. There is a great acceleration of technology, and we must harness that incredible power. I mean, think of the power of geographic information systems to monitor land use change, or now using drones to aid community resource tenure mapping, or crowdsourcing of data to monitor water quality, um, using smart grids to distribute power efficiently, precision farming. There is a sea change and acceleration in technology that we must capture. There's also innovation in finance. There is not enough public finance, but there is enough money to get to that global sustainability tipping point, and it must be involving leveraging the private sector. Public-private partnerships are burgeoning, and they are key. Jeff uses its resources strategically to demonstrate solutions that are scalable through public sector budgets, but also through vastly larger private equity markets. So examples of that would include uh, green bonds for sustainable landscapes and blue bonds for sustainable enterprise in the marine sector. There's also innovation in governance and institutions, and that means really partnering with civil society and indigenous people's networks to promote transparency in environmental decisions, effective tenure regimes, and low-cost community-led solutions for conservation and livelihood development. Jeff is working from the country level down, but also from the community level up. And stakeholder engagement is not just a catchphrase, it's a mantra. Durable change cannot be effective if stakeholders don't want it. They must embrace it. And the third and not least important area is accelerated learning. Jeff and its vast partnership have a special role as a global institution to build the scientific evidence to demonstrate pathways for resilience and for transformation. In this Jeff family, we have a wealth of information on what works and what doesn't work, metrics for success, and these lessons must be made available using the power of information technology, so these best practices and systems thinking in institutional design and arrangements and public-private partnerships and integration and innovation can be scaled up very rapidly. Resources of the Jeff are not huge compared to the problem, but leverage comes from the ability to take an integrated approach to take risks, to measure what works, and to work across all of the countries and regions that our Jeff family represents. So I think we can think of the Jeff like Archimedes' lever. He said, give me a lever and I will move the world. And we must move the earth off of that trajectory of tipping points 
and into sustainability. We have the tools, we have the need, the money exists, and I believe in this room we have the will. We will not be the first generation to leave the next a truly irreversible problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosina. Now, the message from science is very clear. Business as usual, guarantee the disaster, the transformation is the way to go. But how we can really create, trigger the transformation? For so, next two panel, in my view, the dream panel, consisting of the business leaders, who are leading this sustainability, sustainable way, and the uh, leaders of the international institution born for this. Now, I'd like to invite a, our moderator, uh, who is a friend of many of you in this room, and also a very great, great friend of Jeff. Now, Mr. Andrew Steer, the president of WRI. Andrew, thank you so much. Thank you, Naoko. My goodness me, what an amazing morning so far. Uh, just stunningly uh, uh, good. Um, uh, we're going to have a conversation now, and I'm going to invite those that are part of it to come up, starting with President Michel Bachelet from Chile, Paul Pullman, CEO of Unilever, Takahiko Nakao, who is President of the Asian Development Bank, and Eric Sulheim, who is the General, Secretary General of the United Nations Environment Program. Michelle, why don't you sit here? And then Paul. Wasn't it, uh, wasn't it great to see in the top left-hand corner Vietnam in Johan's chart? And isn't it great to be here in Vietnam? I had the privilege of living here for five years, and that's when I first worked with Naoko 20 uh, years ago. And just in that, those two decades, uh, the economy has grown more than fourfold. But as now, Naoko was saying, poverty has fallen from approaching 50% to well below 5%. And what a joy it is to see a country that's really trying its very best to address environmental problems. And how great to hear the Prime Minister this morning. And he started off by saying, first, we need to identify the big problems. Second, we need to evaluate what is working and what isn't working. And third, we need to innovate in finding solutions. A terrific way of starting. And Naoko really set the agenda for uh, today's conversation that we're going to have. And she essentially said, great to do projects that succeed, but given the urgency, we need to do more than that. They need to add up to something towards systemic change. And she asked us to identify what are the blockers to that systemic change and how can we move forward with that. And then the two stunningly good, <laughs> wonderful presidents, women presidents, laid out how that actually is possible uh, within a country. So we're very well equipped. So the, the topic of conversation, the exam question for us today is, um, is how do we get to those positive tipping points? Uh, just as Johan and Rosina pointed out the dangers of getting to negative tipping points, I'd like to start with Paul Pullman. Paul, um, you are a busy man. 70% um, of the households in the world will wake up today with a Unilever product in their house. Um, you have 160,000 people working for you, and yet you are here at the Jeff. What is on your mind? What are you worried about? How do you relate to what you heard this morning? Yeah, thanks, Andrew, and, and thanks, uh, Mayoko, for what do I need to do? Yeah. So what is very important for us is, and uh, not repeating all the data that was uh, being shared with us this morning, which we all uh, fully agree on, but we have really these 15 years to implement the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. 
irrevocably eradicating poverty in a more sustainable and equitable way, leaving no one behind. We all know the words for it, but we need to put it in action. I think broadly we all agree what needs to be done. There's very few people that you meet that want more unemployment, more air pollution, or more people going to bed hungry. We're falling grossly short on the scaling at speed. The implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, three to five trillion dollars a year to make that come alive. Actual money available with ODE and all the best intentions that we talk about here, probably about 160 billion, 160 billion, three to five trillion. So my interest is really is to ensure that we get the private sector to embrace this with scale. We created uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 goals, 169 targets. It's a little bit difficult for the private sector. Any average CEO can probably remember three things at maximum. The name of his wife, the name of his company he works for, and if you're lucky, one other thing. So we need to be um, a little bit more practical and see how we can translate these Sustainable Development Goals into tangible business language. For that, we created the Commission for Business and Sustainable Development. We asked Mark Malik brown to chair that. And what we found was an enormous business opportunity behind the SDGs, at least $12 trillion, looking at some of the focus areas that Johan talked about, and incremental job creation of about 380 million people. So we're trying to translate this to make it obviously a very attractive issue for uh, opportunity for business. And an attractive opportunity it is. Unfortunately, increasingly so, and I say unfortunately, because we're at the point that on nearly all of the Sustainable Development Goals, not acting will actually result in higher cost to us than acting. Which, at the end of the day, for the business community, when you need to get the financials to work for you, is a good position to be in. And that's why I'm optimistic that we increasingly see an accelerated involvement of the private sector in this agenda. I've heard you say that you feel the world's food system is broken. Um, you obviously know a great deal about the world's food system. What do you mean by that? Well, the world food system, if you come in from Mars right now, you must absolutely think that we are, uh, you know, certainly not deserving the title most intelligent species. On the one hand, we're cutting forests of this world. It was Gandhi who said it very well when he said, what we do to the forests of this world is a mere reflection of what we do to ourselves and one another. Uh, then we keep the farmers who produce our food uh, as poor as we can. That seems to be the national sports in every country that we operate. Then we don't like to feed the people in the first thousand days and enormous issues of stunting. And then we have the audacity to waste 30 to 40 percent of our food as if it's nothing. Two billion people nutritional deficiencies, two billion people on the other side obesity. So this food system, although you know we've been able to feed all of us in reasonable amounts, is falling greatly short of providing for everybody and it's causing a lot of the issues that we're having to deal with uh, in other parts of the world. This, this world spends 12 to 14 percent of its GDP on conflict prevention and wars and it certainly is directly linked or indirectly linked for some to a broken food system as well. So what we're trying to do with the Food and Land Use Alliance is bring all these partners together across the food chain to see if we can really redesign it and, and step change it. Very good to see that after Los Cabos in Mexico, where we had the last G20 discussing food security, that we now have Macri in Argentina again putting this on the agenda. What we obviously need to do with, with Jeff and others is to use your funding and see if we can accelerate this progress that we need to make in the food and land use. Four very simple objectives, if I may say. The first one is to be able to feed 9 billion people in a nutritionally healthy way. Uh, the second one is to ensure that the uh, smallholder farmers, and I call them the billion, uh, that still live on less than $1.90 a day if you want to have a decent living. Uh, the third one would be that we protect our planet and we've heard enough about biodiversity, uh, and which is absolutely key. And the fourth one is that we turn this whole food system from a carbon contributor, as Johan eloquently explained, 25%, to actually a carbon sink. It is amazing that the natural solutions in food and land use 
between now and 2030 would more or less account for 37% of the climate change solutions, yet we only spend 4% of our time and energy and money on it. So a gross mismatch that we need to get right. How the 23 countries in Paris put in the INDCs at that time, reforestation, land use, regeneration and all the other things, very few, Vietnam again being the exception, where we have seen reforestation go up from 29% to 41% over the last few decades, but very few countries have started even. Last year deforestation was up by 51%, our forests are becoming carbon emitters instead of carbon sinks, so there is a sense of urgency, and you might say once more is why is the private sector involved? Well, you know, what the reason the private sector is involved is because increasingly they see that being internalized in their business models, which obviously um, prevents them from uh, doing what they know best, which is uh, economic growth and job creation. Thank you very much. Eric Solheim, as uh, the most senior uh, ranking UN official on the environment, and you've been a Minister of Environment and a Minister of Development Cooperation, could you reflect a little on what we heard from uh, Johan and Rosina, and how do we get the balance between sort of a sense of urgency about everything going wrong, but I've also heard you talk about things that are going well, too. Well, my main interest is what's driving change. Because I mean, I have no objection whatsoever to describe the description of the problems which were heard here, but we need to move into how can we fix this this situation? How can we drive change? And uh, a, a very clear example in my view is what has happened on, on global plastics. Two years back, no one talked about plastics. Now, plastic is at the top of the environment agenda everywhere in the world, handled by prime ministers, presidents, and top business leaders. What happened? Uh, I think we, we were able to take an issue and make it central to people. People centered, people are talking about plastic at the kitchen tables all over the world. It's not theoretical, it's here and now. Uh, and that's driving the change, because if you look to the past, what, what has been driving change, I mean, the humanity has fixed so many problems up to this point. We are driving down global poverty fantastically, we are vaccinating basically all children in the world. We wiped out slavery. Gender equality is not fixed, but we are on, on the way to it. There are so many success stories. And what's the theory of change? In my view, change happens when there is a strong citizens' movement demanding change, saying we can't live like this any longer. We want change. Then we need brave politicians like, yes, Michel Bachelet, who, who, who start um, uh, conserving big parts of Chile, and then we need business like Paul, we need the innovation, the technology, the scale, which can only come from, uh, from business. And when we look to the success of the past, in nearly all these cases have been these three, citizens, business, and political leadership, and we should look for the issues for the future where we can replicate that, Plastic is one example, but I can mention a number of other issues in this conversation as to how we can drive change. Because it's not enough to describe the problems. I think even people are basically tired of our descriptions of the problem. What people is want is a can-do atmosphere. How do we drive change? Thank you very much. Well, as someone who did do that, uh, President Bachelet, you did drive change. You were president twice. What did you, as you look back now on your time as president, um, was it easy to um, do all those amazing things that you described, carbon taxes and national parks, marine protected areas, what you did on plastics and so on? Uh, it, it gives, give us some advice. <laughs> well, it's never easy because there's always conflict of interest between different sectors. Even it's not easy within a government because you have the environmental minister who is really keen to do all these things uh, in an integrative way, as our scientists have spoken to us. Uh, but also we have the ministries of ministers of uh, economy and fishing, or the minister of finance, who is more interested and concerned, and feel he will be evaluated if the economy grows in a faster way, or if it doesn't. And they always feel that if you take some decisions, all kinds of decisions, because it was not only about oceans, air pollution, parks, it was also about including a new perspective, a new model on, on the economy. 
but it's not easy either with the private sector. And Paul went there to Chile and helped us a lot, but we had more success at that time with the young uh, entrepreneurs than with the people who were doing things as usual because they were having a lot of money with that. So they didn't realize on the danger of not changing the way of producing or of consuming. So it's not easy, but that's why it's important. Uh, that's why I also tried to uh, speak during my, 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 my keynote speak, is that you need, as Eric was mentioning, all the things. You need the political leadership, you need all the stakeholders involved to be part of the process, and you need the citizens, because sometimes leadership has some difficulties to do what needs to be done. Hmm? Uh, and, and you have to be very convinced that it's the right thing to do. And you need to try to get everybody to agree, but that's not always possible. And then you have to make decisions, make choices. Uh, and that's what a, a leader has to do, when I see. So one of the things, uh, reminding what uh, Eric was mentioning about plastics, uh, as something that today, I mean, if I could say something that encourages me, is that I think awareness is bigger than before. Uh, if I can remember 20 years ago, when you spoke about environment, you would speak about endangered species and animals mainly. And sometimes air pollution, because it was a problem somewhere. But now, this discussion is introduced in other discussions. Transportation, energy, um, um, the consumptions of all consumers, cars, etc., uh, etc. Et and I think that's a good step, but it's not enough. And we need to do much more. Hmm? I was remember that Sylvia Earle, mentioned uh, that nobody cares about oceans many years ago because it can be seen what was happening down there, uh, and, but uh, it, it could be seen land, deforestation, or air pollution. But now with plastic, we have sort of made a big step on that, and probably we need to continue doing much more efforts. We need to have a lot of champions, because for example, Paul was a champion there, going there, speaking to its community, business community, and convincing them how important it was to do those steps. One thing that I believe we need to do better is to make the case better. Because usually when you speak to a finance minister about something, he will tell you how much it costs. Or for example, he will ask you, okay, which will be the benefits for the economy? But the question is, not only on this issue, but also on all sustainable development goals, what is the cost of not doing what we need to do? And we usually don't do that. We have been discussing the World Bank's pink sessions and how we need to calculate the cost of not doing things because that will be, I'm sure, much higher in the midterm and long term that, than doing what we should to do. Uh, and finally, I think we need to focus much more on children and youth. They are really key, not only because they will be the future generations, but because they can bring something new a new perspective and, and can be a very important part of this of this course. That's terrific. Thank you very much. President Nakao, you're head of the Asian Development Bank. The future of the world depends quite a bit on what happens in Asia. How goes the battle uh, with regard to the transition towards more sustainable development here? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for asking that question. And uh, I'd like to start from uh, the context of Asia. And Asia is now the uh, four billion uh, populations, uh, more than half of uh, the world population, and uh, Asia is uh, growing uh, very solidly even after the uh, global financial crisis at the pace of 6%. So in 11 years or so, it is doubling. Uh, so it is very solid economy, but at the same time, there are so many challenges. By the way, by 2050, Asia is expected to be uh, more than half of uh, global GDP. But uh, there are so many challenges. And emission, already Asia is uh, emitting 45% uh, of uh, world uh, CO2 emission. And uh, 300 million is still under the poverty of uh, $1.9 uh, dollars a uh, uh, day. And also 400 people still don't uh, have access to electricity. And water is uh, 300 mi million people still don't have access to safe water. So there are so many challenges. Urbanization is ongoing and how to make uh, urbanization opportunity than just uh, the uh, kind of uh, uh, cost or risk. Uh, there are so many things to do. Uh, so the biggest challenge is how to make this economic growth more sustainable, environmentally friendly, and nature-based uh, approach. 
So in that regard, the ADB is uh, trying to make our uh, lending more toward uh, those goals. And uh, uh, Asia, ADB was started in 1966, when Asia was very poor and uh, feeding people was the most uh, biggest priority. But today, it must be toward uh, the environmentally friendly way. And we uh, lent $20 billion uh, last year, and out of which uh, many are uh, rented to uh, the environmental issues and climate finance is now 4.5 billion dollars a year, including uh, mitigation and adaptation. And the uh, GF, I would like to mention about GF because uh, this is an uh, assembly for GF, and we have had uh, 55 projects so far with the GF. And uh, uh, there are so many things we can do with the GF. Uh, uh, in addition to climate finance. Uh, uh, conservation of uh, natural asset, natural capital, and uh, how to make uh, a kind of uh, disaster uh, resilience uh, using uh, more forest uh, or uh, the uh, uh, other uh, coastal uh, uh, areas. How to use nature uh, as a kind of basis for uh, addressing these issues. GF has a clear advantage, biodiversity and coral triangles uh, in the Pacific great army conservations. There are so many things we can work with the AGF. Thank you very much indeed. I'd like to turn to the issue that Naoko raised, which was we're all aware of negative tipping points, but actually if we're gonna have the revolutions that we need across the different spheres of economic and social life, we're gonna have to see some acceleration and we're gonna have to see positive tipping points being crossed over. And so if you look at sort of some of the great achievements on the environment, think of lead in gasoline. You know, it took the United States 20 years to phase out lead of gasoline. 150 countries then did it in the next 10 years. And when I lived here in Vietnam, Vietnam did it basically overnight. They said, okay, makes sense, we'll do it, just like that. Um, uh, think about ozone, it seemed incredibly difficult to start with. And it was a slow process, lots of negotiations, and gradually accelerated, and then suddenly, oh, CFCs have gone, you know. So what I'd be interested in hearing from you, pick, pick sort of one of the needed tipping points, you know, that, that you're thinking about, and, and identify sort of how close you feel we, need, we are to that tipping point, and what are the ingredients that we need to see that helps cross those tipping points? Eric, you look like you're gonna say something. I think that the, the main issue to overcome the tipping points is what Michelle spoke about. We have, the failure we did in the past was to consider environment as a cost. Uh, take India as an example. For all the times I visited India, there was only one discussion in India, and it was, do we want to develop, or do we want to take care of Mother Earth? And then, surprise, surprise, nearly all Indians wanted to develop. Then comes a new Prime Minister with a completely new message, which is India can do both. India can rapidly bring everyone out of poverty, provide electricity to all villages, provide toilets to people, but it can do it with a focus on the environment, on solar energy, on cleaning up and creating jobs and prosperity by going green. And of course, that is the message which brings people on board. And the failure we have done as environmentalists is far too often to consider and speak as if environment is a cost rather than an opportunity. In the United States of America, there are five times more jobs in the solar industry than in coal. Still, we allow central politicians to speak as if the jobs are in coal. So I believe the number one message for our change is this, to, to consider environment much more an opportunity, social, economic opportunity for people, uh, rather than an cost. And an obvious area for that, if you allow me one, is the city transformation. Nearly all cities in the world are suffocated in traffic. We spend hours in, in traffic. Many people speak, spend three or four hours in traffic back and forth the world. Enormous economic cost, enormous welfare cost. Uh, pollution is now the biggest killer of humans, again, related to traffic. The obvious transformation we need to do, building mass transit systems, designing the cities for walking and, and biking, and of course moving into electrical mobility, electrical bikes, electrical cars, 
uh, here in Vietnam with all the success. Uh, there is an enormous armada of motorbikes. But obviously these motorbikes can be moved into electrical bikes. And you will get as fast uh, to the job with the electrical bike as you do with the motorbike. Uh, so uh, putting on the agenda, I mean nearly all mayors of the world are, are, are uh, looking to the same problem, whether you are in Hanoi or in Santiago or in Kinshasa, <laughs> or, or, or wherever you are, the problems are by and large the same. And the solution we can bring with Jeff money and with good political advice is a complete transformation of the cities and the well-being, the economy and the environment and climate all will benefit from these policies. Thank you. Nakao san. Yes, uh, I feel that the tipping uh, point is already uh, coming or has come, and uh, especially after uh, COP21 of uh, 2015 and SDG goals. When I visited countries and met leaders and ministers and, and uh, others, they really regard uh, these issues uh, very closely to their own agenda. So they are not talking about uh, uh, the environmental impact, but also they feel uh, the mitigations of uh, 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 the uh, climate change is uh, their role, their, uh, their responsibilities. It's not just about they feel that uh, they are vulnerable to disasters created by this climate change, but they feel they should be part of uh, the uh, responsibility. When I met uh, Prime Minister Modi or President Widodo or, uh, the, of course, uh, Prime Minister Fukuka, they regard the uh, national contributions, uh, uh, determine the national contributions as a part of uh, their agenda because uh, they must take care of uh, climate change impact, so adaptation is important. But at the same time, if uh, they don't act, uh, the world cannot act. Uh, of course, uh, developed countries have uh, more responsibilities. But imagine economies already joined this force and also uh, private sector is already very keen because uh, there is a business opportunity and unless they are compatible with this global agenda. They cannot survive. So we already uh, are crossing the tipping point. That is my feeling. Great. Thank you very much. Paul Pullman. Yeah, I think we should be uh, positive. We see a lot of tipping points happening after Paris, for example, where the global uh, go the governments of the world basically said we're going to decarbonize our global economy. That sent an enormous signal to the private sector. We've seen an acceleration of the divestiture movement, the green bond movement, the uh, calling for a price on carbon. Uh, we are now more or less at 23% of the world's carbon emission systems on a price or a cap and trade. Um, so so a momentum is building. You see it with uh, renewable energy, electric vehicles, the initiative that you are leading at WRI on 12.3 uh, on food waste, so there are a lot of tipping points happening that I think. But the task is not easy and we should not fool ourselves. What we have to do is basically four fundamental things to change our systems that we need to focus on. The first one is to decarbonize our global economy. I just talked about it. The second one is to move, which was mentioned before, to move from a linear economy with a uh, make, use, dispose and waste to a circular economy. We just simply can't afford the way we're having our consumption systems now. The third thing is to, at the same time, move the financial markets to the longer term. We've become too obsessed with shareholder primacy. Your Mickey Mouse chart from Johan. We need to really move the financial markets to the longer term to provide that space to address these issues which take more time. And then finally, we need to find an economic system that doesn't function to the benefit of a few, but to the benefit of many. And these are quite big systemic changes that need to happen, frankly, if I may say, at a time that global governance is failing us. So it's not the easiest time in human mankind. What I'm enthusiastic about and why I think uh, uh, I'm sitting here as well with the energy that I have is that I think the private sector is coming to realize that they need to help de-risk the political process they need to realize increasingly that they cannot be bystanders in a system that gives them life in the first place. So increasingly, you see the private sector stepping up to be part of this agenda. That's a tipping point in itself that we need to seize. What are some of the drivers of that? I think the first and foremost driver of that are the citizens of this world itself. 
the millennial generation is definitely more pur purpose driven, is definitely more environmentally and socially conscious. And they are putting their word where their mouth is. The B corporations, benefit corporations, that have a social and an environmental model next to a financial model, um, are one some of the fastest growing companies. Uh, we see it in food where the market is rapidly changing to bio-organic or neighborhood farms and all the other things. So this, this young population and women, may I say, we have to bet on them. The second thing is what um, uh, President Brachelet already said again is, we are at a point that people are starting to understand that not acting costs you more than acting. And the last thing, which is the good side of technology, which has a lot of questions that are being raised lately as well, but the good side is it creates some transparency. This world has an enormous lack of trust and we cannot work together at the levels we need in partnerships, etc., if we don't address that trust. And fortunately, with this transparency that the Internet gives us, I think we will flush out the bad behavior quicker, be it corruption at all different levels of society, be it waste uh, at the expense of, of other people, be it labor standards in your value chain. So don't underestimate the combination of young people, the economics of it, and the trust driven by transparency that are key enablers to get these tipping points. My final comment is, I used to get very frustrated if I would meet people that weren't doing the obvious. And that's not very good because it's not up to us to judge these other people. It's really up to us to behave ourselves in the right way. And I've started to discover is that in order to create a tipping point, you don't need many people in the room. You just need the right people in the room. If you want to create a tipping point on deforestation and you have palm oil, you need Indonesia, Malaysia, you might need the World Bank, you need the biggest traders or users. So focusing on the tipping points usually means focus on 30 of something. We see the same now with the food system, the food and land use system that we're rapidly trying to address. Get the right people in the room and you can move things forward and work on that positive energy and positive momentum. And Fortunately, there are a lot of people that share that opinion, which makes it fun to do. <laughs> Superb. Thank you very much. That's great. Now, Arco is starting to applaud there, <laughs> quite rightly. So, President Bachelet, um, building on that, you said a really interesting thing in your speech. You said, if you want transformation, you have to get everybody to feel they're part of it. What did you mean? <clears throat> What I meant to say is that uh, in order to get sustainable development, it's not only about one person who can be clear about it, or um, one leader who can make decisions, uh, and, and very quick and fast decisions, because as the Vietnamese that you mentioned, uh, they decided that's the right thing to do, we do it. I did the same thing in my country. But for sustainable development, unfortunately, and for all the causes that we're discussing, it's not about one tipping point, it's not about one action that we can make. It's about so many different actions and actors involved if you really want to get the results. I mean, Johan and Rosina has mentioned to us a lot of different things that means the complexity of this. So even though um, I, in Paris, when we signed the agreement, I had a glimpse of hope. But again, not every country is with Paris Agreement anymore. If you don't have everybody on board, first of all, at the global level, you won't have the results you, you want. Second, the same happens at the local level or at a national level. You need everyone, for example, you need consumers to change their consuming habits. You need uh, the industrial sector to change their consumer models, their, their models of production, and so on. But mainly because I believe that you change, you transform, not only with big policies, but also with everyday action. And that's what you need to take into consideration and include. So, uh, and one of the things that I think is very complicated too is uh, integration. Rosina spoke to us about integration, but I think we have a problem. For example, the SDGs, they're great, but everyone works by side. I mean, health works in health issues and so on. We have not been able, and I'm not sure if the wedding cake is enough to solve the problem of this lack of creating the synergies of the integration between the different goals. 
It's very complicated to integrate, it's how to coordinate, but I think that's a challenge we need to solve, because otherwise, if we just work in parallel ways, we're not, we'll have, we'll have the, the results that we need. So integration is not only about private, private inter, uh, inter partnership, it's also about you know, how we integrate the whole, the different levels, the different global transformations that we need. And people is always there to remember that once they elected that they need to do the right thing. Oh, that's terrific. Now, you, you, you said something to me yesterday which I found very interesting when I said, how do you bring everyone on board? And you said, you can't. You, you actually have to bring those that will help you have the, the strength politically and then you have to break through. Well, yes, I mean, I know that the ideal model is that you bring everybody on board so everybody's happy and it's a win-win solution. But unfortunately, when you have to make tough decisions, it's not a win-win solution for everyone in the next minute. It will be in the midterm or the long term. So uh, one of the problems that politicians usually, usually have is that they have political times that are different from the planet times, if I may say. If because politicians are four years, five years, or six years in government, and you need, when you look at environmental issues, you cannot look only on the short term. For many leaders, that's a difficult thing. So they need to identify what the problem is. They need to understand that you need to have to think on mid-term and long-term consequences. But also, they will have to include some quick gains so they can really be on board. But a leader should make what it needs to be done. Try to bring everybody on board, but not stop from doing what is the right thing to do. That's terrific. I'm going to ask you all a final question, which is to give you a warning, which is there are many environment ministers in the room and many people who are very senior officials in environment ministries. Do you have a piece of advice for environment ministers? But, but for, while you're thinking about that, Paul, I just wanted to come back to you one more time on this issue of leadership and making tough decisions. I mean, on day one as CEO of Unilever, you abolished quarterly reporting. Since then, you've systematically you know, set targets and, and really greened your company and, and made the point that your company needs to play a role bigger than the $60 billion that you, know, you sell each year. You're trying to change the world. How difficult is that? I mean, you, if I may ask a personal question, I mean, this last year, someone tried to take over your company. You fought them off. Your share, high, share price has done exceedingly well. Um, how difficult is it and how lonely is it? Oh, it's difficult. And, and how it's could so the hard. Jeff help you? It's uh, difficult, it's not to deny that, because the road of change has a lot of skeptics and cynics, and that's not only in politics, that's everywhere. And um, if it would be that easy, someone would have done it before us. But I think there are enough people that are driven by a deeper sense of purpose. I mean, leadership is first and foremost about being a human being, but then it's also about putting the interest of others ahead of your own, knowing that by doing so, you're better off yourself. You know, we need to start thinking intergenerational. It, it just hurts that we are this generation in the 30 years that have done more damage to this planet than all the people that came before us, that we're depriving next generations of that same opportunity that we've become accustomed to. So respect for everybody, investing in others, thinking intergenerational are some basic human values that keep us all together at a time that these human values are being challenged by some people in political systems. We should be even fighting more for that. So if you have a strong sense of purpose, I think it's easier to deal with these things and, and drive them forward. Uh, an inner compass or a true north, as some people say, and that's why I advocate with a lot of things that we're doing that many of the businesses need to be more purpose-driven and not just be myopically focused on the shareholder and shareholder value. And these sustainable development goals offer, that, offer a great opportunity. I would even go that far to say that if businesses cannot explain what their contribu positive contributions are to society, they have no reason for being here. We should not accept them. If businesses cannot explain what they are doing to contribute to some or all of these sustainable development goals, they literally miss their purpose and we should actually vote them out of office. And we are doing that. The average length of a publicly traded company has dropped now to 17 years. So what we are saying to business people, wake up. 
if you really believe in a longer term business model, then it needs to be also more environmentally and socially conscious. Hence, we need a new different social contract. Hence, we need to put prices on environmental and social capital. It was Hubert Reeves, a, a, a Canadian philosopher, who said it very well in one of his books that I read. He said, man is the most insane species. He worships an invisible God and destroys a visible nature. Not realizing that the physical nature he destroys is the invisible God he worships in the first place. Which brings me to my final comment is, if we would just all start to live by something that you find in all religions, from Hinduism to Buddhism, from Judaism to Christianity, it's the golden rule. Do unto others, and I would add the planet, what you would like to be done to yourselves. If we would just apply that principle in any decision we take, I think this world would already be significantly ahead of where we find it today. Terrific. Thank you very much indeed. So uh, the, 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 the final question then, brief, brief answers. Uh, President Nakao, you work with environment ministers throughout Asia. Any advice? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I, 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 my background is uh, finance ministries, so I shouldn't uh, tell what to do to the environmental ministries. But uh, generally, I feel that uh, there are too much emphasis on the uh, economic instruments or financing. But regulations and laws are so important. When Japan faced uh, serious issues of pollution in 1970, around 1970, what made changes court decisions that uh, the uh, polluters must uh, uh, have evidence that they don't pollute and they don't. If they don't, they must pay for compensation. They must address these issues. And environmental ministry played a very important role over changing the regulations and laws so that environment should be cared more than economic uh, things if uh, there are issues. So regulations and laws are so still important. And another element is a target and national goals. Uh, uh, national, determined national goals is one thing, but uh, when I talk to the Minister of Finance of uh, China, when I asked why the China could make uh, such a difference of uh, high growth after the 1980s or uh, late 1970s, he mentioned it is not, not just the government guidance, but it is a social movement. So it's a kind of social driver. So the environmental ministry can, in a sense, uh, have a uh, national movement or social drivers to address such issues like a pattern of consumption. We shouldn't waste the food. We shouldn't waste the energy. We shouldn't make rooms too cold by air condition. We, should, we don't need to live in a, such a big house. We, maybe we should more uh, change our lifestyle so that we should respect nature more and we should live to, together with the nature. That kind of things we cannot do through the uh, uh, finance ministry, uh, but the environment ministry can do it. I, I really believe it. Great. Well, from a finance ministry guy, that was terrific. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, Eric, you were a minister of environment, and actually when you were minister, you introduced some legislation, I think the Nature Diversity Act, and someone called it the most important piece of legislation on the environment in 100 years in Norway. Is that right? But what would, advice would you give? Uh, in short, my advice is to learn from the plastics, meaning how we were able to take this issue from a non-discussion into the top of the global agenda in basically one year. I believe the critical issue is that we made it so concrete. It was people could act in their own life. I mean, you can throw away the straws. You don't need them. You can start refilling your bottle. You can drink from glasses. It's very concrete. We can throw away one-use plastic cutlery. There is no need for all this. So people could act in their own life and of course through that put pressure on politicians and business. But it, of course it was also about the big picture of the world, how we save the whales who are dying from this, or the seabirds, or the elephants, or the cows. So it linked the small issues which are very close to people with the big. And I believe the number one issue for us as environment ministers is to change the narrative. Uh, change the narrative into a much more positive one how we can use environment as a tool to create prosperity and economic development. And by the way, that's not done by the two maybe most important politicians in the world. President Xi Jinping of China, his main slogan is green is gold. Meaning, of course, that going green in China, you can create any number of jobs, opportunities. 
or Prime Minister Modi of India setting up how he can, yes, bring everyone out of poverty and have 7% economic growth by doing it in, with solar energy and any number of environment policies. So change to a positive narrative, a can-do narrative, and not just describing the problems in the world, which we do very, I mean, I'm expert on that, but telling people what are the, what are the solutions, what can we do? Because that's what people uh, want to hear. And finally, speak a language people can understand. Because if we turn a day, people speak very intellectually down to people, we will fail. We need to speak a people's language, a can-do atmosphere, and be much more positive. And if you want to capture it in one slogan, Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. Great. Thank you, Eric. Um, President Bachelet, you were the boss of several environment ministers. Well, uh, I, I was the boss of one environment minister, in my, but one in each government. Um, no, I think, uh, well, as I mentioned before, we need to make better the case uh, in the same direction that Eric was saying. Because I've learned in life, not only in environmental issues, but other in gender issues and so on, that it's not about the right thing to do that will make somebody make the right decision. It's also to show that the right thing to do is the smart thing to do. So we need to show that this is beneficial. We need to show, I have more showcases that on, on green economy and blue economy that can really show people. And I think uh, it's not only about words, because as Eric mentioned, I was thinking, oh, how did we came into this plastic thing now? It's about those images. There is this very old saying, one image is worthy a thousand words. You know, and I think we need to link uh, to be to be better, make the case better in terms of making it closer to the people, so people will feel it's important, and will make people who are making the decisions also feel it's important. So uh, I, I I will make it short because I agree with what I've said. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Paul. Final word. No, I have a very simple message. You came into this world for a certain purpose. You decided to become a minister to serve your country. You decided to become an environmental minister because you care about the planet. You decided to be here today because you want to do something about it. So the world, the world is long on words and short on actions. I always like the African proverb that if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. We're at this point in humanity, exciting as it may be, challenging as it may be, that we need to go together, which requires us to work at a different level than we've done before, which requires us to embrace others, even if we're not used to working with them. It means business learning to work with civil society or with governments. It means governments learning to work with the private sector. Only if we put the interest of others ahead of our own, only if we embrace this multilateral partnership, Will we solve the challenges that we have before us? Baseline management or playing not to lose will simply not do it anymore. We're a thousand days in on the sustainable development goals. The plane is on the runway. It's moving, but it's not lifting off because the engines haven't started revving yet. We need to turn up the engines. And the only way that we can do that is to put the interest again once more of others ahead of our own and start to behave like adults and work together to solve the issues that we have. We don't need more PhDs in this world, in due respect to the PhDs. We don't need to go to Mars to find the answers. We have all the solutions that are here with us. We have an abundance of money in this world that we can put to good use. The only thing that is missing, frankly, is our own leadership and human willpower. And it needs all of us to move that forward. And I want to thank you for that. Ah, brilliant ending. Thank you, Paul. Um, Michelle Bachelet, Eric Solheim, Takehiko Nakao, Paul Pullman. Let's give a round of applause to all of them now. Thank you for a wonderful day. We're going to thank you very much indeed. Um, I was going to say you are dismissed, but you can't say that to the president of a country, can you? Um, <laughs> or of a major bank. We're going to have a second conversation now. Uh, before we do that, though, um, Kristalina Georgieva, the CEO of the World Bank, was planning to be here, but unfortunately, at the last moment, 
she had to chair a board meeting, which doesn't seem to me as important as being here, but nonetheless, she had to do it. And she has a one-minute video that we're going to watch now. Dear, dear participants in the GF Assembly, greetings from Washington and very deep regrets I'm not there with you. I have to chair a very important board meeting related to our capital increase, but I wanted to personally convey to you the commitment of my institution, the World Bank, and my personal commitment to the very important objectives of the GEF. With a strong replenishment, the GEF is in a position to do more to help our world step on a sustainable development path. And we are going to be strong partner in this journey to transformation of our food systems, the way we use land and water, how we care about our biodiversity and the actions we take in our cities to protect our climate, to secure our future. I wish you all the success in your deliberations. That was very nice. Chris Kristalina is a, a huge supporter of the Global Environment Facility and isn't it great that we have a CEO of the World Bank that, that used to be the Director of the Environment Department of the World Bank, which is uh, Kristalina. Could I ask the next panel to come up please? Sunny Vergis, the CEO of OLAM. Um, Christiana Pasca Palmer, who's the Executive Secretary of the Convention for Biological Diversity. Sasuma Chakrabarti, the President of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and Akim Steiner, the head of UNDP. Please, uh, it's free seating. Now the, uh, the exam question for the second panel builds upon the first, and it's, uh, but it's good. we're now going to apply a little bit more, uh, come down to earth as to what are the implications for the Jeff and what are the implications for finance in general and public finance in um, particular. Um, maybe we turn first to you, Sunny. Um, uh, Sunny runs Olam. Um, not everyone in the world has heard of Olam. It's one of the biggest um, food companies. Um, Sunny is actually, I've heard you called, the biggest farmer in the world. You have more <laughs> farmers working for you than, than anywhere else in the, anyone else in the whole world. So you know a lot about farming. Um, but also, you have a, a wonderful sort of commitment to transform agriculture around the world. And uh, you now are also the chair of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. As you look around the room and you think about the $4.1 billion that the GEF now has the privilege to allocate, sort of what advice would you give? What do you find exciting that's going on right now? So we, Olam is a B2B company, and that's why, as uh, Andrew uh, alluded to, most of you would probably not have heard of us. But there's a reasonable chance that we touch your daily lives in some form or the other, because we deliver over 50 agricultural raw materials and ingredients to over 23,000 customers, who in turn then make food products of various kinds to deliver to all of us in this room. So there's a reasonable chance that we will touch your lives on a daily basis. I think the case in the previous panel was very conclusively made about the global food and agricultural system being broken. And I won't go through all the facts, whether it is the, I won't go through all the data points that have already been very eloquently expressed by the previous panel. But if you want to really uh, reimagine global agriculture, and that is the case that was made by the previous panel, incremental changes to try and fix our agricultural system will not get us there. So if you want to fundamentally reimagine global agriculture, which means how do you produce more with less resources? Less greenhouse gas intensity, less water intensity or footprint, less waste emissions, and also from a social capital standpoint, because we know that there are 500 million smallholder farming households, and how do we make sure that the social capital, in terms of catalyzing their livelihoods, is at the same time with building the natural capital, that goal is achieved. And in order for that to achieve, public finance from organizations like Jeff would be critical in making that transformation happen. 
But given the vast expanse and scale and scope of agricultural production and food production, it would be very important for us to prioritize where we can make the best improvements at scale. Which commodities and agricultural commodities should we prioritize? Which countries and geographies should we prioritize? So for example, in terms of agricultural commodities, rice is a commodity that is grown as a crop in developing economies for consumption in developing economies. More than half the world's population eats rice or consumes rice. And if you look at the growth in population that we are envisaging of an additional 2.2 billion people to be added to the 7.45 billion people that we have today, most of them, most of their growth is going to happen in Asia and Africa, where again rice is going to be a principal item of consumption. So if we have to increase rice production to meet this challenge by at least 25%, how are we going to do that given that rice is the most greenhouse gas intensive crop that we can grow? It accounts for 10% of all the world's greenhouse gas emissions in terms of methane. And if you look at a large producer exporter like Thailand, which is the largest exporter of rice in the world, the second most uh, emitting sector, GHG emitting sector in Thailand, is agriculture. And within agriculture, 55% of all the emissions are accounted for by rice. So it accounts for 20% of the calorie needs of the world. And therefore, focusing on a crop like rice would make a big difference in addressing and solving for this problem. How can we do that? We can do that in pilot programs and scales. Olam, my own company today, works with 8,000 rice farmers in Nigeria as an example. We intend to grow our uh, rice uh, program to about 55,000 farmers. But there are 150 million households out of the 500 million smallholder households who are engaged in agriculture. How do we scale and reach solutions for them to grow rice on a sustainable basis but given rice is very energy intensive and there's no minerals and vitamins, how do you solve for fortifying that rice so that you can provide adequate nutrition to the people that eat that rice? And how do you do it in an environmentally sustainable way in terms of water usage, in terms of greenhouse gas emission, in terms of waste, and also in terms of protecting and restoring biodiversity? For that, I think public financing, like Jeff's financing, would be a catalyst. And we are now developing a program along with other key stakeholders for a GEF support. And this will be convened by the UN Environment Agency. It will be convened by the IRI, the science base of this, by uh, GIZ, and almost uh, uh, in the sustainable rice platform, which is the model that we want to expand for inclusive rice landscapes, 50% of the funding is coming from the private sector. And there are already 80 partners involved in the program, all of whom are willing and ready to support an intervention in terms of public finance from Jeff. And the last point that I want to make is in addition to public financing, also sustainability funding is now on the rise. My own company, in just a few months ago, we raised $500 million in a sustainability loan program, which is based on 50 sustainability indicators. And every year, Sustain Analytics, a third party verifier, will, match, uh, will map our footprint in terms of the improvements that we have made on those 50 sustainability indicators. And if we improve on those sustainability indicators, our cost of borrowing comes down based on the improvements that we create. It's a direct example of doing good and doing well at the same time. Thank you very much. That's a one big idea. Now, Ko, I hope you and others wrote it down. A major, a major thrust on rice. Yeah. Increase yields, dramatically reduce uh, environmental yeah. damage. Uh, so, Suma, um, you uh, not only in your second term as president of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, you used to run the Department for International Development, DFID, in England. So, you know a lot about um, allocating public and private funds. What's on your mind? Well, the question here is really about how do you embed system change? And by the way, let me say I'm really glad to be here. Big, big uh, congratulations to Nalco and her leadership team, I think, for what they've achieved on Jeff 7. Uh, and I think we feel in our relationship with uh, the Jeff, that is about system change. How do you get system change in an institution like an MDB, like uh, EBRD, 
first of all, we were fortunate in the time we were created in 1991. We were running up to the Rio conference in 92. I'm, I'm a veteran of that conference. Uh, and there was emphasis at that time on putting the environment center stage. So we're the first MDB that had environment actually as an objective written into our articles uh, established in the bank. But secondly, I think I do pay a lot of tribute to my colleagues, George Tanaka and others at the EBRD, for what they did to turn that into something that would incentivize our staff to take this really, really seriously. So it is absolutely embedded through our scorecards and everything else. We have a target to get to 40% of all our investments by 2020. Being in the green economy space, we actually achieved that target last year. We're at 43%. Nice problem to have now is how we maintain that <laughs> progress. But it's a good thing to have, and that's because of the drive of people like uh, Josue and others in that. I think we have four, basically four lessons we've learned, I would say, about uh, how to take this forward with the countries of operation that we work with as an MDB. One would be the importance of promoting the right sort of uh, policies. Uh, and I'm going to give an example of the wrong sort of policies to, to illustrate what I mean. So we made a lot of progress in many countries on renewables, for example. And I think that's been a very, very good thing. Uh, the technology has helped, the pricing has come down, it's made it much more viable. But one of the things that you need to have for investments in that area is a long-term consistent policy framework. So the problems we find when, quite often when we're trying to invest in this area is when countries adopt that framework then change their minds because of electoral cycles and others, uh, other things like that. And that makes it very difficult to invest for the long term. I have plenty of other examples of countries which have followed that long-term example. There are also too many countries still debating the path of good policies over a long, consistent period. That's number one, I think. It's an MDB task to really persuade them to stick to the long-term path. Secondly, we need to find instruments, particularly these days, with a shortage of public finance, instruments that will crowd in, leverage in private sector finance. And that is, of course, what EBRD, given our focus on the private sector particularly, does. We found many different ways of doing it. Direct financing, quite often, to companies. Uh, by the way, I should say, for the interest of disclosure, that Sunny's company is one of our most esteemed clients as well. We're investing with them. Uh, but also indirect financing through the local banking system. It's very important to try and build up a local banking system so they do this sort of lending really, really well in this area. And finding those instruments that leverages the private sector, brings them in, into the uh, picture is very important. Thirdly, although we as an MDB focus very much on market-based pricing in what we do, that's why we were set up very much to create markets, it is also very important to recognize, given the ex externalities in this area, that you will need an element of grant financing, without a doubt. And so blended financing has to be really developed. And for that, you need good rules, so that actually all the MDBs are actually supporting each other to implement the right sort of rules around this. But that's an area where, you know, we make some progress, I think, but we've still got some further uh, room, for, room for progress there as well. And fourthly, I would say the importance of supporting institutions. This is a time-honored development uh, goal, of course, but in this area particularly, it's not just ministries of environment I'm talking about. I'm also talking about, in our case, the private sector institutions that we're working with. Let's take a small company in a small place like Kyrgyz Republic. How do you get them to sustain the improvements they might be making by investing with the right technology to uh, help, with the car uh, with help with the climate how do you get them to sustain that? And that means you put in more effort through technical assistance and others to try and help build the capability, the capacity in those private sector institutions as well as the state institutions as well. Uh, and on the state side, I'm very proud of the work we've been doing with countries like Turkey or Egypt. But when we've been working on policies, we've been also thinking about how do you sustain this in the relevant ministries with the right capability as well. So I think you've got a four-pronged attack, I would say, to try and build the systems wide and um, uh, change and embed it. That's terrific. Thank you very much, uh, Suma. Um, Christina Pascapama, you're now head of the Biodiversity Convention, um, a convention that actually hasn't had the same zip recently as the Climate Change Convention, um, but you're going to change that. Um, uh, and how could the GEF help you do that? <clears throat> Thank you very much. I don't know if I would change it. Certainly, I can't change it alone, but I will probably be able to change it with all of your support. Um, 
Look, I think uh, Johan posed a very, very critical picture of where we are and where we are heading, and a challenge and a call to all of us to act as planetary stewards. So how are we going to, we talk a lot about transformation and systems transformation, but how do we transition to that path and how do we accelerate that transition? I want to focus for a second on what role governments can play in this transition because the governments are the, um, the countries for which we work. So the Convention on Biological Diversity has 196 uh, parties, 196 countries. And in the ecosystems of actors, this togetherness, that we together can, can uh, steer the planet on a different path. Obviously, the governments have an enormous role to play, and they can guide and orient this transition to a more sustainable world. One aspect of that, I think, it's going back to the roots of the problem, which is the economic development and the growth models, where the natural capital doesn't find itself a place. So when we talk about how do we ensure human prosperity within the planetary boundaries, we have to factor in the planetary boundaries in the economic development and growth models. And that's not yet happening in many governments. There are some pioneers out there that demonstrate that you can do it both right and well and smart and generate profit, but it's not yet widespread. So governments can embrace that. Secondly, when we talk about transitions, I think governments can have a, a very important role to enable these transitions to happen, to enable what President Bachelet was talking about, this dialogue space, the transitions arena, where people come together, where businesses come together, and talk about where do we want to go and how do we head there. You have to have enabling policies to, to shift that and to empower the actors to be agents of change, businesses being one of them. Thirdly, Embracing the natural capital accounting framework. And uh, our colleagues and Akimits here from UNDP and the Biofin uh, program, which is already demonstrating how uh, you, know, you, you, you can look at, uh, at, at biodiversity as a capital, but also internalizing uh, into decision making. And adopting what um, some call a sustainable balance sheet in all policy sectors. So in other words, make biodiversity and natural capital as center, recognize it as the fund it was at the basis of, of Johann's wedding cake. It is the fundamental uh, capital that supports life on Earth. So we have to, to give it space in the economic models. Um, and finally, I think combining a conservation approach with a restoration, with a natural restoration approach. Because another mind shift that has to change is that there isn't really a, a trade-off or a war between biodiversity or taking care of the environment and development. You know, this whole philosophy of let us grow first and we clean after or we mitigate the impact after has to change. We can grow sustainably by um, taking on board all these ideas from the very beginning. So the conservation and restoration are, are pillars that we look into when we design uh, in 2020 a new global deal, a new global framework for biodiversity or, or for nature. So I think if we, if we bring all this together, uh, and if governments, and there are many ministers here uh, in the room, so I would like to, to invite and call on them to, to consider these issues because you know, as the president was saying, uh, Chile could do it, uh, Marshall Islands did it, Vietnam did it, you know, look at the, the picture. So if they can do it, all of us can do it. And it's only together that we can steer the planet on a, on a different pathway. And we have very little time for that. So action, less words and more action, it's what I'm calling for. Thanks. Mm, thank you very much indeed, Christiana. And Last but certainly not least, uh, Akim, you've been head of UN Environment, you're head of UNDP, you used to be head of IUCN as well. Um, no one's had more experience of sustainable development um, and the action thereof. Um, what would you like to say at this stage? <clears throat> Hi. Thank you, Andrew. I, I've been listening with, with great interest because in all the, the answers you have solicited, this notion of systems change obviously is, is part of it. And I'm very conscious of the fact that now, as we meet here at the, the sixth GF assembly, um, a system within a system has grown over the years. But I think when we talk about systems change, 
in this room here, and I mean, Rosina is sitting here, Johan was here earlier on, much of what defines systems actually comes out of ecology and ecosystems. And, you know, when we breathe air, we, we have the product of mycosium marriages between trees and fungi, uh, layers of plankton in the oceans interacting, food involves, um, you know, a trillion microbial species interacting. So I think one of the things that we have to be very conscious of is that we often are focused on this ecosystem, on the life support systems on our planet, and yet alongside that has grown up an entirely separate system. The social economic system, the economy as we call it today, the financial markets. Um, I think the journey of sustainable development that, that over the last 20 to 30 years has led us to now talk about systems change is a constant effort at actually connecting two separate universes. Systems that function not only in parallel, but as we have learned also, um, in a sense, in, in ways that one system is beginning to undermine the functionality of the other. The sustainable development agenda, sustainable development goals from Rio through many other summits and efforts, <clears throat> time and again have tried to figure out a way in which we can reconnect these systems and actually make them operate in, in symbiosis. So when you ask me today in terms of where the GF takes us next, it is very much taking an understanding of how our ecosystems work or our life support systems on the planet and linking it to where that other system that has become so dominant functions. Um, Sunny just spoke about this in a very specific context uh, of rice production also. Um, uh, Suma, you just spoke in terms of investments. I think we are at a point where much of what happens next will really depend on whether we can uh, refocus that system which we call the economy or the socio-economic system and understand what drives it because if you cannot unlock that we are essentially living not only in a parasitic relationship it's actually a destructive one and i imagine we'll, we'll come in the course of this discussion to to the let's say the platforms on which this can happen the gef7 uh, has the food and land use um, systems approach for instance I think it's a very interesting one. Sunny, you already spoke to one element of how to connect this. I think the whole question of financing and, and investment is key. Um, my colleague Adriana gave me a figure this morning that made me sit up again and think this is precisely the illustration of two parallel systems working in, in opposite directions. We roughly invest $20 billion a year in sustainable forest management, but we actually deploy $770 billion a year in the opposite direction, which is essentially to cut down forests, to change land use. This is um, a system of, of financing and of economic incentives and drivers that is just at cross-purpose to what we actually consider sustainable systems management. So again, the GEF, I think, has significant opportunities to bring into this discussion the points of connection, and, and that will determine what happens next. Uh, thank you, Akim. By the way, could I just ask you, I know you are, you are in some ways refreshing UNDP. Um, uh, just tell us a word about that. Well, um, it reminds me of the advert of Heineken, you know, that um, reaches parts that other beers can't reach. So I don't know. When you said I used to head IUCN and then uh, UNEP and now UNDP, I was beginning to think maybe um, there, is a, there is a warning in there. But i tell you why, why I'm excited about it, because the journey that, that you described in terms of my own professional uh, journey, in many ways is actually related to what I just spoke about. I mean, I find myself now heading the UN's development program at a moment in time when we have a sustainable development agenda that is without precedent. I mean, it spells out precisely the sort of things that we have been trying to articulate and work towards, the SDGs, the principle of universality. You know, at this particular moment, we live in a political context that is extremely worrying. When everybody knows that we have to work together, we can only solve these problems together, we have the reemergence of nationalism, of protectionism, of divisiveness, and, and even the questioning of principles of multilateralism, where those who have greater capacity to act, greater responsibility to act, also should take the leadership in acting. All of this is being questioned at the moment. And so, yes, I do see this moment in time of leading UNDP as part of the, the philosophy of multilateralism and also the platform on which the world can come together 
as extremely exciting. And to do so with the agenda that we now have, I think um, makes the institutional constraints actually um, ones that I believe one can overcome. The bigger challenge will be whether we can capture the imagination of people and begin to push back on this very poisonous um, discourse that is really permeating more and more countries and societies and it takes us away from what we actually need. It takes us towards conflict, it takes us towards blaming the other and ultimately it takes us back to the specter of war and competition that we do not need nor can we afford at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so Summa, um, you mentioned you know how central the private sector is. The EBRD was the first among the multilateral banks really to sort of merge its operations with regard to the private sector and the public sector. I mean, you're, you're, that's what you do, you know, policy and then private investment. As you look now at the GF, uh, it's got $4.1 billion to allocate. What advice would you give them with regard to this issue? Well, I think uh, uh, Nauka and her team are already on the case. I think they have recognized in the in the service replenishment very much the importance of the private sector. It's come to the fore. I think what the private sector naturally looks for is both to do good but a return as well. So the importance is very much to focus on those instruments, those types of structures of deals that can actually bring both. Uh, and we have, as I said earlier, been helped by some things that have gone in our direction, like pricing has made things more viable uh, on renewables, for example. But it's very, very important to engage, I found, with the private sector early on in the process to discuss how you might take this forward. What are they looking for in terms of frameworks within countries? I'll give you an example here. Take Egypt. Why is it that Egypt has been so successful now in getting so many people involved in solar power suddenly? And it's because they spent quite a long time, with the help of the World Bank, the EBRD and others, thinking through what would be the right uh, framework, regulatory framework, for renewables before they went into the investment space. And it took a hell of a lot of work, a lot of argument as well. But we were able to act as a conduit for the private sector to bring their views to the Egyptian government and then devise a regulatory framework that has now made this a really successful venture. I visited the Ben Ban uh, solar park uh, in Aswan uh, governorate. It will be the largest solar park in the whole of Africa and it's taken off completely. But the amount of work, upfront work required to convince the private sector that they would have a long-term consistent regulatory framework to work with was immense. And that's where I think Jeff, uh, uh, using us and others as implementing agencies, can really make a difference, actually focusing on that nexus between the ministries that are involved, but also the private sector in making them work together. Uh, and I think that's the, that's the future. The other area I would say and I'm looking forward to this as a piece of work with um, the Global Environment F Facility, is around cities in particular. I think we're going to have a panel on this this afternoon, so I won't <laughs> say what I'm going to say this afternoon now. But I think the cities area is a really exciting uh, space for us to work with. There are many, many cities now which are much more go-ahead and much less statist in their approach to this uh, set of issues. Much more willing to embrace the private In our case, Amman, and Cairo, and, and Cairo potentially, but Amman certainly in Jordan uh, has been a real go-ahead city for EBRD as well, but there are several others coming forward. And lastly, investment climate issues. More broadly, um, many people in the private sector don't just judge how investable a country is in the environment space by what's happening in the environment space. They also judge by looking at how this country is doing more broadly on investment climate issues. So the World Bank's the ease of doing business survey and so on are very, very important to them. And you make one mistake in one area in terms of policy and you infect the attitude of businesses towards that country in other areas too. So you need to have an eye also on other areas which are not necessarily to do with the environment at all uh, in order to make sure there's a consistent approach to uh, private sector engagement. So it's quite a lot of work to do, but I'm very much looking forward in the seventh replenishment to working very hard, to putting forward some proposals as well to the Jeff for how EBRD can take this forward with them. Thank you very much, Sir Soma. I'm glad you mentioned this afternoon session because I think the purpose of those now, Co, is, um, it, is to go deeper on this notion of systemic change 
across these major areas of economic and social life, whether cities, whether land use and food, whether the oceans, whether energy, um, and so on. Um, and so it, it, not everyone will be at every session this afternoon, so if any of you want to sort of, uh, you know, fly a flag for the particular session you're in, please feel free uh, to do so. Sonny, um, you, um, you're quite an unusual company in the sense that you deal with farmers on the ground, often fairly small farmers, it's not affluent farmers often, and then you work with development agencies and with local governments in a way that most private sector wouldn't do. For example, in the central highlands of Vietnam, you're working with UNDP and with local governments. Tell us about that, because it's sort of a new way of doing business, actually. And, and what implication would that have for the future of the GEF? Yeah, I just want to step back. Uh, Paul did make the case for why private sector should be involved and why private sector should put sustainability at the heart of their business. And he said it is the right thing to do. And in addition to that, there's also an economic reason why we should put sustainability at the heart of our business. And it is now established that if you look at the S&P 500 companies, only 14% of their market capitalization is driven by their tangible assets. 84% of their market capitalization is driven by many intangible assets. That includes intangible assets like their brand reputation, the know-how, et cetera, but intellectual capital. But more importantly, what Krishna mentioned, the natural capital, the social capital, and the human capital. So 84% of our value is going to be driven by all these other forms of capital. It is only right that as business leaders and stewards of shareholder uh, investments, we focus on maximizing long-term value by building all these strategic assets. So I want to give probably an example of sustainability in action at OLAM. We have launched something called OLAM at Source, which is embedding a sustainability chip, a little bit like Intel inside. This is OLAM inside, that if our customers buy their cocoa or the coffee or the palm or other requirements from us, we will give them uh, sustainability information on 80 indicators, which includes social capital and natural capital areas. So how much greenhouse gas emissions to deliver that cocoa to them, or how much water to deliver the coffee to them, and how much waste footprint, which farmers did we buy from, how many, all the details of the farmers, how much did we transform their livelihoods, increase their productivity, increase the quality that they produce. So all of that information we provide, as a result, we are getting more stickiness with our customers. We are getting larger share of his wallet. And we are also getting some pricing power and premium. So another example of why sustainability pays, it's not just a cost. So Paul's point that as businesses, we need to both maximize purpose and maximize value concurrently. And it's a false debate to say that it's an either or choice. You can do only one of those two things. We can be both purpose maximizers and value maximizers at the same time. The Central Highland Vietnam project is we source a lot of coffee and pepper from the Central Highlands. And we believe that we can develop deforestation free supply chains for the coffee and pepper that we grow, uh, that we grow and that we source from smallholder farmers in partnership with other agencies like UNDP, FAO, etc. And that is a program that we are now developing on a large scale in the Central Highlands in Vietnam. But we have similar programs across the 70 countries that we operate, but in different commodities and different supply chains. Because our ecosystem consists of 4.7 million smallholder farmers. Apart from the fact that we are also farmers and planters ourselves, we grow these raw materials ourselves, but we also source and originate from another 4.7 million farmers. And we don't have a future if they don't have a future. They've got to be prosperous for us to be prosperous. Could we just talk a little bit about, you, you said an interesting thing there, which is we've got to trace things through the supply chain, and that's yeah. been difficult because we haven't had the metrics. Yeah. We haven't actually known, and you're saying you're putting together a system. Talk a little more about that, and, and then I'd like to come on to Christiana, because in a way, that's been one of the problems of biodiversity, isn't it? That, that you know, we haven't had a narrative that includes data that sort of, um, that everyone is trustworthy and we can trace back to, if you like, the perpetrator? So firstly, you need a farmer information system. So we need to geotag all the farmers from whom we are buying. And we need to have information on the farmer in terms of his households, how many women farmers are there in the household? Is there any child labor in his supply chain? 
what are the crops that he grows, what is his access to microfinance, what is his access to inputs, what is his market access. And from the farmer information systems, that farmer information systems has to then talk to your ERP backbone. So we have a SAP ERP backbone. So you have to link that farmer information systems to that backbone. And then you have to have a customer digital engagement portal so that in a digitally enabled way, at the click of a button, the customer can track all of his uh, uh, supply contracts that he has with us, exactly which farmer it originates from. And then you have to do all of the mapping of the footprint, the social footprint and the natural capital footprint. So 47 out of the 80 indicators that we give our customers in terms of sustainability indicators, 47 of them are footprinting indicators. So I think the metrics are there. Uh, and I think uh, Johan very clearly explained the boundaries and the planetary boundaries and how we are hurtling towards, we already breached four, hurtling towards uh, one or two more. And if you're not careful, we could be having cataclysmic disruptive climate change impacts. So the science is there, the science-based targets is there, the metrics is there. The systems to track and trace is very complex. And that is what I think we have been able to crack now and I think that is scalable across the sector to get the same information. And then we need policy and regulatory framework to come into play to say that if you produce things in a more sustainable way, you will be rewarded either by the customer or by somebody. So for that, you need policy. So carbon tax, a few countries have, probably 40 countries and subnational governments today have some form of carbon tax. But the whole world should have carbon tax. That incentivizes the smallholder farmer, the large farmer, to produce things on a sustainable basis with a lower natural capital footprint or so higher so social capital footprint. Terrific. Thank you. Christiana. I wonder if I... Yeah, thank you. Well, it's true that I think in, 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 uh, in the convention space, um, the monitoring and... Uh, review, let's say, the progress that the countries are making towards achieving the, the current targets, because we have at the global level 20, 20 biodiversity targets established in 2011, and they have a lifetime until 2020, so the IG biodiversity targets. Um, the system there, it's, and it's a governance system, that it perhaps needs a lot of improvement, and that's something, again, that we will love to see uh, being more enhanced in the, in the post-2020 uh, but global biodiversity agenda. But what, what Sunny is talking about, it's the role of technology, if I understand it uh, well, and how this can help monitoring and, uh, and assessing progress, both at the company level, but then aggregating that at the country level. So in a way, when, when, um, when countries make an agreement in a biodiversity convention, in a multilateral environmental agreement, that then trickles down at the national level, at the local level. So I think, the four industrial revolution and some of the development in technologies that we see there, particularly blockchain and others that would enable the traceability all the way to the source, are very encouraging in setting much more robust monitoring frameworks for, uh, for the post-2020. But that, of course, has to be negotiated and, and agreed. I want to make another point on, on how uh, Jeff could help this, uh, this transition and transformation because the GF is the main financial instrument for the convention, at least for biodiversity, it's the only one we have. Our sister climate change convention, now they have also the Green Climate Fund. Um, and it, and it's, I, I really want to congratulate Naoko and the entire GF team for, for moving things in this direction of uh, adopting a systems approach. Um, so they will play a critical role in helping our countries to make this transition, to look at, at biodiversity as nature, uh, as natural capital and embed it in the system transformation. But that's not going to be enough. The envelope is very small for, for the uh, scale of transformation that we want to see. So we would need to be very creative in terms of um, finance uh, resource mobilization and perhaps better use the uh, public funds available to leverage and blend and um, unlock some of the uh, 
considerable financial resources that exist in, in the private sector in the insurance uh, schemes. So I see a, a, an important role for GF in that. And when we will be considering um, as part of the resource mobilization framework for the implementation of the new global biodiversity framework, I think it may be time to, to think creatively of how we can, uh, we can use these funds to leverage more because we will need a lot of resources uh, financially. In addition, I think in the means of implementation, uh, it, the capacity building and this technology knowledge, technology transfer would be very, very important. So a package of, of the how, the means, how to implement the, the transitions that we want to see, it's, it's relevant. Thank you very much. Um, just staying on this theme, and then we're heading rapidly towards lunch at this stage. Um, uh, Suma and Akim, both of you have given a lot of thought, and you operate daily in financial uh, issues. Um, on this issue of metrics, um, Akim, you launched the program for sort of greening the banking system. Suma, that's what you try and do every day. Do you feel that the financial markets are gradually shifting, you know, of the $100 trillion that are in, in uh, institutional assets, apparently 20 trillion of those now take ESG, environment, social and governance into account. Do you feel encouraged by what's happening? And do you see any engagement for the Jeff in nudging that along further? Well, I think the answer to your Second question, absolutely. I think the GEF in its catalytic um, role has always been both um, trigger, incubator, a place where people can experiment. And I think what, uh, and I imagine Suma will, will, will agree with this, I think what we are seeing is the increasing capacity of markets, including financial markets, to reinvent themselves. And I think back to you know, our systems discussion, uh, Sunny spoke about supply chains, we spoke about markets. I mean, these are systems and they are very often the product of choices that we make in regulatory forms. And the idea that markets are simply um, an issue of demand and supply, I think is one of the great myths I've always felt that has paralyzed intelligent, smart public policy and has also essentially surrendered choices about our economy to just a few people based on their insights, brilliant as they may be. So, you know, UNDP's daily business, the business of many of our organizations, is to help governments make intelligent choices on behalf of their countries, regulate markets, incentivize markets. So when we look at something like renewable energy, I mean, we, we have all lived in just a decade and a half from a global economy that laughed at the idea that major industrialized economies would produce 10, 20, 30, never mind 40, 50 percent of their electricity with renewables. It's already happening. The 300 plus billion dollar investment market is an example of how an entire system, the energy investment market system, has been turned on its head. Um, I learned just last week that HSBC, as one of the banks that is now moving into this SDG financing era, um, launched an SDG bond for a billion dollars and it was three times oversubscribed. And it's going to be the same as with green bonds. They're now well over $150 billion, but the first six, seven years was almost a flat curve, and then it went vertical. The SDGs are two or three years away from leveraging literally hundreds of billions of dollars. My point here is, yes, the GA play an important catalytic role, as long as we bear in mind that we're dealing with systems that require not just um, you know, a sort of free array of players coming together, if we want to meet the timelines and the scale on which we need to transform our economies, regulation, public policy, public consensus are fundamental because markets are inherently conservative. They are not going to be the risk takers if we do not give them the signals. And Paul, I think you spoke to the Paris Agreement. Maybe its most fundamental legacy will be that it changed the signal to the world from one where carbon intensity was still the way forward to it's going to be a low carbon future. Then everything else follows from that. And the last word on what I have now begun to put a lot of um, energy into with UNDP, trying to understand in that notion of markets and supply chains, first of all, data. I think it's one of the great areas we are working together, learning together. Um, we are living in a digital age where so much more is possible, right down to the consumer having instant access to information, traceability. 
But if you want to affect markets and investments, I think um, the validation of impact becomes critical. Whether it's social impact investment or it's simply markets that want to carry certain risks or not, our ability to inform these kinds of investment markets of the future with um, a validation of impact um, and the way we can do that with indices, with data, but also with the legitimacy of institutions, I think could play an enormous role in turning the trickle of um, finance into literally a flood, and that within 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, Akim. Sasuma. Well, not a lot to add to what Akim said. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Um, not a lot to add to what uh, Akim said, um, but I fully agree with him. I think if you go back 10 years ago, I would not have bet on the way the system has changed, both in the collection of data and metrics and all that, very useful, but in the way that certain players like central banks have come to the fore. I would never have bet that the central bank in UK, the Bank of England, Mark Carney, a leading uh, player in this area, I wouldn't have bet that in Bangladesh, the, the central bank has been, would have become such a big exponent in this area, for example. I wouldn't have bet that the task force on financial disclosure would have got as far with its recommendations, green bonds, as Akim said, and so on. So I think we actually underestimated ourselves, actually, in terms of turning this uh, system around. The next step for me is actually not at this stratospheric global level. It's actually a very much a local level. What I would like to see is the development of more local capital markets in smaller countries, which are really focusing on these sort of instruments. And you can begin to see that in some countries. In, in the case of EBRD, actually, we've made a major push on this. But in the MDB system as a whole, we're still, well, in my view, not doing as enough. If you look at the amount of local currency financing we're doing for uh, climate finance type things, it's actually quite small. At, uh, and you know, we need to really make a major push on that. But I'm much more confident about that now than I would have been 10 years ago because of what's happened in the last 10 years with the central banks and other new players who have really taken this and seen actually that there is a market out there, that actually capitalism and uh, the environmental space can actually work together. So I'm much more optimistic because of that. Great, thank you. Final question to you all, brief answers. Um, as we go to lunch, we need some encouragement and some hope. We've had a lot of it already today. Um, one thing you've seen recently, or one thing you're working on, that, that gives you a sort of spring in your step that, uh, that makes you feel encouraged? Who wants to go first? Christiana. Okay, can you hear me? In one sentence, maybe in three sentences. So, um, in 1992, when my country just came out of the uh, fall of the Iron Curtain, and that's the year when the convention was established, I told my parents I'm going to become an ecologist. And they said, oh, what? What is that? <laughs> no, you're going to be a doctor or an engineer. No, I'm going to become an ecologist. I want to understand how the planet functions. So. That was the understanding at the time of something that it's now a very mainstream topic in, in many respects. Almost 30 years later, I'm sharing the stage here with people like, like Paul and, and uh, all of you. When I was in grad school, I was told that um, you know, the Milton Friedman thesis, the company exists to generate profit for the shareholders. And here I am with some am amazing leaders in business who say, well, if the company is not a force for good, what, what are they there for? That gives me tremendous hope. Uh, hearing the president from Chile increasing the protected areas from 3% to 43% and say, demonstrating with actions and with facts that it is possible to have both protection of the planet but also development and lifting people out of poverty, that gives me tremendous hope and a boost of energy and motivation to really try to take our dear convention and, and all of you who are part of it on a journey to perhaps be good stewards for the planet and put the earth systems at the center of the conversation as they deserve. So that was more than one sentence, but thank you for that. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Sunny. I'm afraid, Christina, I'll follow suit. Uh, the one thing that gives me hope is that we have reversed the trend on one of the nine planetary boundaries, which is the depletion of the ozone layer. If as a collective actions that we took, we could reverse the trend, 
I feel confident that the challenge that Johan has thrown at us about reversing the trend on the other eight planetary boundaries is doable. The second hope that I have is that in order for us to really change, we need five things to come together. We need to be the change that we want to see in others. Eric mentioned that in the last panel. So we have to individually change. Our companies have to change. If our companies don't change, we change individually, we're not going to be able to achieve any change. Thirdly, our sectors have to change. The system transformation that we were talking about, the food, land, and water, energy, circular economy, urban cities, transportation, these sectors have to change, and we need a sectoral roadmap. But the most important thing that I want to mention is the fourth thing, is that the private sector has to trust the civil society. Civil society has to trust private sector. Civil society, multilateral agencies are very good at the big picture and very good at the bold policy pronouncements. What the private sector is good is at execution and innovation. Only if both of us come together can we achieve any meaningful change. And finally, government and policy makers also have to come to the party. If all these five things happen, we can change the world. Great. Thank you, Sunny, very much. So, Suma. Well, follow that. Uh, impossible. I think uh, I, I agree very much with Christiana and Sunny, but let me just say one thing. What was a niche activity 20 plus years ago is now a core activity. And you can see that firstly in who attends these meetings. At Rio and at the first assembly of the Jeff, I was at both those events. It really was a very much a niche activity. Uh, Soul set of players. And now it's completely changed. What was a niche activity for companies, like, I guess, like Unilever and others, where this would be corporate social responsibility in those pages of the annual report, has become center stage as part of their core activity. That is a complete transformation. What would have been uh, for an MDB like EBRD, something we'd also have said, oh, we do a bit of you know, this sort of climate finance on the side. From 2006, it became a core activity and is now center stage. And frankly, the thing we're probably most proud of now that we do. That's the transformation. And all of you have played a part in that. And without you, it wouldn't have happened. We have a long way to go, as Sonny says, five things he set out. But I actually really feel that we are on the road here to a transformation, much more than I could have said 20 odd years ago. Wonderful. Thank you, Soma. Akim. I think, Andrew, it's, it's um, above all leadership and courage. I mean, if you look at what really is changing the world today, it's people who step out of their comfort zone and they trigger change because they engage with others. And um, whether it is people who represent the private sector and are here in this world that often had great difficulties in dealing with that, whether it is people who step out of the environmental world, and I urge you all, this is not an age to retreat into our community. This is an age where you have to step out. You have to step across lines because that's the only way you can actually begin to scale up changes. And I was reminded when... Is that censorship? No. <laughs> on on uh, green finance, I mean, you and I spoke at the time when I, I began this work with you, because it was ludicrous that an environmental organization would begin with cent engage with central bank governors and, and with the G20. But, you know, that's how change happens. And that's why I remain because there are a lot of people today, incredibly competent, courageous, exercise your leadership, but not within your own community, in the communities that need to become allies. I think that's the... Great, a wonderful uh, conversation. Um, a personal word from, from me. Uh, the World Resources Institute that I represent, it is a huge privilege for us to work with the Global Environment Facility. And I, I, I want to thank the council members, the governors, the secretariat, the direction that the GF is going in, focusing not only on highly successful projects, but on this notion of systemic change, um, is, is so right. And the conversations we've had this morning, the brilliant speeches we've had this morning, they all add up to that. And, and this afternoon, we're going to go deeper. So thank you to all of you for in this room for really making that happen. And I, I loved what the four you just said now about your, your signs of hope. I mean, there's, there's a real story there. So um, Christiana, uh, Sunny, Summer, Akim, thank you very much. Let's give them a round of applause and then lunch.
So thank you everybody. Uh, if I may join, just join this Andrew's inquiry, that's a sign of hope. I just would like to introduce a fat Nick Stan, Lord Stan said uh, maybe a, a month ago to one of the WRI hosted dinner. He said 20 years ago, environmental economics is the area where a economist who are not able to get into the hardcore economist is the area. Now, environmental economics is the most interesting area. The bank people and the economists are rushing into it. I just want to share with you, to me, that word is a sign of hope. I was so encouraged to hear the last session, including Andrew, that you know, everybody joined and shared you the signs of the hope. That is a kind of great encouragement for us to be a, a courageous enough to go for transformation. However, in order for us to go for transformation, I think we need to eat. So we need some energy. So it's a good time for us to go break for lunch. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, heads of delegation and special guests are invited by our CEO to lunch in the Furama Hotel Ocean Ballroom. It's one floor up. There are smaller vans outside to take you to the lobby of the Furama, so you can go there. All the rest of us are also welcome to have lunch together in the old conference center, also at the Furama, but further out. So the larger buses will take the rest of us there. So I hope that's clear. Heads of delegation in the Ocean Ballroom, everybody else, and the special guests, of course, in the Ocean Ballroom, and all the rest of us in the old conference center. Enjoy your lunch. See you back here in the afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>